This lecture is about why biomedical anthropology is crucial to political decisions about the future of life, life science and local health. Biomedical anthropology can shed light on how knowledge, belief, truth function in society. To anthropologists, knowledge and belief um, are actually uh, given meaning by the worlds that share them. And, well, in other words, that's about culture. Um, so culture is what we perceive through. Uh, through culture, we have give uh, meaning to uh, the beginning of life, the end of life, uh, to a life worth living. And because there are many cultures, there are many different conceptions about what life is, conception, death, both religious and secular. In our society, scientific truth has a lot of symbolic value. Um, biotechnologies have been influencing society a lot over the last couple of decades. Um, they raised many issues uh, ranging from abortion to prenatal genetic testing, from euthanasia to brain death, from uh, bioengineering to uh, human cloning. And usually it's bioethicists that discuss these issues and bioethicists are usually experts uh, with a background of uh, uh, philosophy, of medicine uh, or of law. But I believe that it is biomedical anthropology that uh, could give a very important uh, contribution uh, to insights about the way the life sciences interact with daily life. And this leads me to two questions that I believe that biomedical anthropology should respond to. Well, the first is, what makes biomedical knowledge and treatment valid and credible to people uh, with different cultural traditions? The second is, can biomedical anthropology help us understand the interaction between biomedical knowledge and local traditions and beliefs? And if so, how? Anthrop anthropology in the past has taken distance from biological reductionism. Uh, anthropology has been aware, especially through studies uh, related to uh, gender disability and uh, race discrimination, uh, and uh, realised that uh, it would be problematic to uh, link concepts of uh, genetics to daily uh, behaviour of human beings. Unfortunately, this has also uh, led to uh, too little attention of biomedical anthropology uh, for the life sciences. Well, geneticists themselves have had problems using the concept of race and ethnicity in their own work. I remember that in 2002, a Dutch geneticist asked an audience uh, because he wanted to know what he had to call uh, genetic groups that uh, need to have uh, me medicine that is especially made for people with a, a certain genetic makeup. I don't believe that he ever got an, an answer, not from social scientists either. For some time, anthropologists have also accused uh, scientists uh, for monopolizing concepts of truth. Uh, but many scientists themselves, they would agree with the following statements, that truth is not a product of science, science is not pure thought but practice, science bears the marks of the places and cultures where it is produced. And many scientists would actually agree that the autonomy of science lies in its accuracy and its efficaciousness. However, David Bloor, a sociologist of science, he argued that the authority and validity of science have to be earned. And this happens through a very complex process between the life sciences and society involving trust and the uh, power of social institutions. 
So we have a trend in which science, that, that regards science as one, the only sole source of truth. And there is another trend, uh, a more pluralistic trend, in which science is seen as only one source of the truth. So this leads me to uh, two dilemmas that I want to discuss. The first is, how do life sciences affect the culture of truth, underpinning the existential values of communities? And second, if evidence-based medicine is also shaped through culture, how do we know which applications or therapies are valid? I first will speak about a concept that I use, genomism, and then I will uh, discuss what is regarded as good science in the context of global life science collaborations uh, using the example of stem cell experimentation. And I will finalize with the contribution that biomedical anthropology can make to the life sciences. First of all, genomics. Genomics and other omics. Well, a genome is the complete set of DNA of a single cell. And genomics is uh, the study of biological systems um, by sequencing uh, DNA or by genetic mapping. When in 2001 uh, the draft of the human ge gen genome was first presented, um, it was presented uh, as the blueprint of uh, human beings. But soon after that, it became clear that there were other maps important to human inheritance, such as metabolomics um, and epigenomics uh, and proteomics. And these omics, they very much influenced uh, the way that the social sciences and other sciences have been conceptualizing human life. For instance, in social psychology and criminology, it led to genetic, uh, the concept of the genetic propensity of psychopathological behavior and criminality. In medicine, genetic testing, disease etiology, genetic epidemiology, genetic engineering and drug screening um, made great headway into the diagnosis and uh, approach to serious diseases. In physical anthropology, uh, it helped uh, creating uh, genetic typologies, which enabled characterizations of race. In forensics, it generated the concept of genetic fingerprints. In migration studies and population genetics, um, it actually rewrote the way we see history. And in employment law, uh, privacy law and insurance law, new practices of insurance, employment, policy and rights to privacy have come about. In international relations and politics, new concepts of biosecurity and what is called big data have come about. With the concept of genomism, I don't mean to reject genomics or genetic testing. What I want to do is just point at the problematics uh, that regards genomics as the privileged belief that underpins cultural cosmologies. It led to the celebration of the human genome project spirit of owned by all, done by all and shared by all. It is complete with a, a genomist narrative, with a genetic origin, uh, a diaspora of um, a mitochondrial DNA and paternal uh, DNA. It has a fall, a genetic fall, associated with incest or consanguinous uh, mating. Um, it also has a resurrection of healthy man um, that can be uh, seen in the enormous uh, efforts of uh, genomic sequencing and biobanking. It has bioethical commandments and it has a direction towards a heaven of genetic enhancement that is supported by many. These kind of concepts have also influenced uh, the way that people in Asia conceptualize society. 
And in my own research and as of my colleagues, uh, we c came across many concepts of genomist culture in political discourses on various cultures in Asia. For instance, the archaeological finds of uh, Yuan Mo Man, uh, which is uh, the uh, alpha uh, ancestor of the uh, Han, Han Chinese, um, it is traced back to um, a place in Yunnan, which is a, a province in southwestern China, uh, where Yuan Mo Man lived approximately 1.7 million years ago. But nowadays, Yunnan is also the home of many ethnic minorities that live in that province. But when Yuan Mo Man was linked and associated with the emperor, the yellow emperor, uh, the ancestor of the Han Chinese, then it seemed as if Yunnan became pure Han or Chinese territory. Another example of how uh, the concept of genetics has led to ideological interpretations of human history is the example of Zhonghua China. Zhonghua is another word for China, but it means all of China. All of the uh, Chinese uh, minorities are uh, included in this concept. Well, geneticists, uh, especially uh, experts on migration and population studies have come about with the claim that the difference between the northern and southern Chinese is bigger than between the southern Chinese and the ethnic minorities of China, including the Tibetans and the people from um, Xinjiang. And so this means that uh, through the concept of genomics, uh, a political view of a united China has come about. Um, in Yunnan, in the capital of Kunming, we can find the world's largest ethnic biobank. Um, it contains thousands of immortalized blood samples um, containing the 56 um, uh, national minority, uh, sorry, um, ethnic minorities of China. Uh, this bank uh, was used um, to uh, make studies on the minorities uh, living in Yunnan and other provinces in China. Uh, a claim was made that the superstitious beliefs of the people uh, and endogamy, uh, which is a marriage within the family, uh, were related and led to birth defects and uh, also genetic uh, disorders. And this was followed by a prohibition of consang uh, consanguous uh, matings or, or incestuous pr uh, practices, as it was called in the politics. This didn't lead to a solution of the problem itself so much as to stigmatization of ethnic groups. In 1994, uh, the so-called new eugenics law was announced. It meant that apart from the one-child policy, um, the policy of premarital um, uh, testing uh, became an institution in China. It became compulsory. So couples that wanted to get married had to go to their hospital to get a test on uh, their family background and on their own uh, uh, health. And if people, if a couple or one of a couple uh, would have a serious disease such as schizophrenia or uh, depression, the couple would be dissuaded from marriage. This policy uh, had serious consequences for people personally and for their families. In 2003, however, this policy uh, was no longer compulsory, but it still had uh, created a culture in which the concept of eugenics and the idea of genetic inferiority or superiority had become part and parcel of Chinese culture. And in this slide you see uh, textbooks that show couples that um, how to achieve good birth and uh, good raising. In Chongqing, um, a large uh, 
city in uh, China, uh, you find Chongqing's Children's Palace children that are being tested for talent genes um, using 11 genetic markers, uh, including for uh, intelligence, uh, memory, focus, music, sports, and others. Of course, the science of this uh, is disputed. But it did let, lead to an at atmosphere um, in which people became scared to become stigmatized. They were scared to get a test for muscular dystrophy or for thalassemia. And it also led to the first genetic uh, discrimination court case in China in 2009, um, where uh, three people who went for a civil servant's examination were disqualified for the job uh, because they were carriers of thalassemia. Of course, these kind of practices are not limited to China. In India, we find that uh, genetic testing was done among tribal people and uh, where people had sickle cell uh, disease, uh, they were given color cards. Depending on the kind of cards they got, um, it indicated where they were sufferer, carrier or free from sickle cell disease. And of course, tribes with a high percentage of sickle cell disease were worried uh, that they would be stigmatized. And for women, it became very difficult, if known, uh, that to find a, a partner in marriage. The issue of privacy in genomics is not uh, confined to these two cultures either. It's a global one. Uh, genomic banks have been set up uh, in many countries in the world, and the meaning of privacy seems to have changed. When, in December 2012, uh, David Cameron uh, had uh, announced the 100K, 100,000 genome project, um, this was a project that would gather the uh, human genomes of uh, patients over five years, a lot of attention was paid to the privacy issue. People were guaranteed that their uh, data would remain anonymous. But when, at a later date, uh, the British Personal Genome Project was set up, it was made clear to uh, the, the uh, donors of uh, DNA um, that privacy or anonymization could no longer be uh, guaranteed. And when we look at a, a large city in China called Wuhan, uh, we see that in hospitals, uh, millions of genetic samples have been stored in biobanks. And um, there was one scientist that I noticed asked the help uh, from social scientists to study this phenomena because he was very worried about the political uh, implications of this. Um, in the area of reproductive issues, uh, uh, reproductive uh, decision making, uh, genetics, genomics has also uh, led to various global issues. Uh, for instance, non-invasive prenatal testing, even uh, though this kind of testing has uh, improved and made safe uh, the uh, screening for chromosomal abnormalities before birth, um, it has opened the door for so-called fetal whole genome screening, which will make it possible to see the genetic cause of many diseases in the fetus already. And this will lead uh, to prospective parents uh, to ha face, uh, that they will face very difficult uh, decisions. Um, an example of a, a strong uh, leader in this field uh, is a company called BGI. Um, they engage in uh, the provision of uh, what is called uh, NIPT uh, testing, but at the same time do research into the genetic factors in, for, in IQ uh, or intelligence, uh, intelligence. And by combining uh, this knowledge um, and prenatal testing, uh, the very young scientists that lead this project uh, say that they aim to lower the number of people with low IQs in the Chinese population. 
uh, whether they will succeed or not is one issue. But the ideology attached to this um, seems to be one that needs to be discussed more widely. In Japan we see similar science fiction-like discussions around very real developments. Um, one discussion is about uh, the ability to use uh, what is called IPS um, to create artificially uh, human gametes. Uh, so that could be human eggs or uh, sperm. And uh, using them in combination with uh, uh, genetic uh, screening uh, to uh, create children artificially. And when we look in Europe, we see a debate going on about in vitro eugenics, also followed closely by Lord Robert Winston and, uh, well, actually mainly led by a scientist called Dr. David Sparrow. I believe, though, that for genomics to be successful, we need more than bioethics and education. We need deliberation that allows communities to accept technologies on their own terms. And we need to build communication bridges between communities with different materials and cultural values, needs and aims. This brings me to the second topic of uh, this lecture, uh, which is experimental stem cell therapies. Well, these bridges, these communication bridges, that concept is very easily translated into uh, notions of international science bridges. But this example will show um, how that uh, concept should be actually treated with great care. Well, first of all, human stem cells. Well, stem cells are biological cells um, that uh, can be found in uh, various parts of the human body and in uh, an embryo. Uh, you can find them in the bone marrow, in the teeth, in fat, in skin uh, and many other parts of the body. Uh, they are used to repair tissues um, for many and potentially they can be used to um, help people with uh, uh, a stroke, with blindness, with diabetes, spinal cord injury and so on. There are routine and innovative stem cell therapies. One example of a routine uh, practice established for many decades now is uh, the use of uh, hematopological uh, stem cells for blood diseases. Uh, well, leukemia is a very familiar example, I believe. Um, other kind of treatments, stem cell treatments, are usually regarded as experimental um, examples. Uh, of such treatment um, are treatments, well, they're usually only used for serious uh, intractable uh, diseases uh, in um, especially hospitals uh, that are governed uh, by the state. Uh, but that's too much of a generalization. Um, but examples of uh, these intractable diseases are spinal cord injury, ALS, Parkinson's disease. Um, on the other hand, there are also many therapies being developed for cosmetic aims, for instance for uh, breast augmentation or uh, as an anti-aging treatment. They are also used for the creation of blood in the military or uh, there are sports applications uh, to uh, speed up healing and strengthen the muscles. Um, if not uh, researched through clinical trials, uh, usually these uh, treatments are seen as violating regulations or as unethical. Uh, they also require what is called good laboratory practice. Um, but clinical trials and good laboratory practice are very expensive. Uh, for this reason, uh, many academics and uh, companies, uh, they collaborate uh, and to pool funding. Other advantages uh, of such collaborations uh, is, for instance, uh, when uh, there are uh, patient pools available in other countries or uh, less strict regulation. Um, in order to facilitate these collaborations, the International Society for Stem Cell Research um, has developed uh, 
uh, guidelines for patient treatment and research uh, to facilitate these uh, collaborations. Um, when uh, practitioners or researchers violate these guidelines, often uh, their work is seen as uh, rogue. And it's been pointed out that to certain countries, many tourists travel, so-called stem cell tourists, to get treatment. But if there are international guidelines, how can experimental stem cell therapy uh, continue and be provided? Well, there are two factors that explain this, I believe. First is the limitation of universal stem cell research and therapy regulation. Uh, second is the inadequacy of international standards currently used for clinical stem cell trials. Stem cell regulation has been developed to protect patients and also to protect uh, stem cell researchers. And in many countries, um, regulation has been developed also to protect the reputation of uh, stem cell uh, research. And because this happens for various reasons, um, the adoption of um, international stem cell regulation, be it from other countries or from the uh, ISSCR, um, has also been used politically. Um, it is believed that a country that adopts the regulation uh, of stem cell research into national guidelines, for instance, or uh, company guidelines, um, can also interpret these guidelines very flexible. The Japanese company, uh, Kawasaki Heavy Industry, um, is a case in point. Uh, they produced the so-called Kawasaki robot um, and deposited this in Bangkok uh, in the hope to test its um, robot uh, in the production of high-quality stem cells that could be used in clinical trials. Doubting that they would get permission in Japan very soon, they hoped that this would go quicker in Thailand. Also, profiting from the cheap, high-quality expertise available there, the infrastructure and the patient pool. And this example is certainly not isolated. Um, it's nowadays expected from um, principal investigators of uh, important uh, life science projects to behave like managers of what I call bio-networks. And now the standards. Standards for patient treatment, uh, research and equipment have become internationalised. Uh, this would be to uh, make exchanges of biological materials and treatments and products easier. Um, but it also has some uh, side effects. Um, in Asia we see that there is much life science innovation being developed. But as we saw earlier, if knowledge is not being acknowledged, then the value of it will never be known. Because it's very expensive to develop this kind of knowledge, um, many countries have created special experimental spaces for innovation and of course this has led to many bioethical controversies about patient safety and the quality of products. But the regulation of many countries in this world allows these kind of spaces. In Europe for instance we see the hospital exemption, in the United States we see the uh, investigational new drug uh, regulation that allows payment for treatment to a certain extent. And we see the use of military and police hospitals in various countries, including uh, China. And in East Asia, in quite wealthy countries such as South Korea and uh, in Japan, we see that uh, nowadays, uh, quite recently in Japan, um, business licenses are given as soon as cell products are indicated to be safe and potentially efficacious. So what is ethical treatment depends very much on where you are and what you need. So it may depend on the availability of a healthcare 
system, uh, payment conventions, uh, alternative treatment available and safety and efficacy information in a country. Um, this has led to difficulties in judging whether uh, treatment is uh, ethical or not. Um, it seems that a contradiction being created between ethical clinical trials and rogue treatment is kind of artificial. For instance, uh, a professor of immunology in Guangzhou in China um, for many years has been treating patients with guest versus host disease as a result of bone marrow transplantation for thalassemia. At the time, he heard that uh, the company Osiris was holding uh, clinical trials. And he also heard that in Japan there were various people doing research in this area. And because he had many patients queuing up in front of his door demanding treatment, he decided, even though it was regarded as unethical at the time, to use mesenchymal stem cell treatment um, in order to help these patients, even though this treatment is not really allowed. Well, coming back to uh, the third theme of the role of biomedical anthropology in the life sciences, um, I will say a few things more about how we should discuss these issues about ethicality in the life sciences. Well, coming back to the genomics, um, part of this lecture, I asked what makes biomedical knowledge and treatment valid and credible in different cultures? Well, the straight answer would be it has to do with politics, the politics of knowledge. Um, well, the application of genomics requires society to alter in order to be successful in adopting new technology, so this requires political will. And we've seen that genomism can lead to controversial banking and testing practices, controversy about belief. It has implications for territorial sovereignty. Um, it may scare off those who need genetic tests and it may lead to genetic discrimination. It might uh, lead to the leaking of private uh, information. So for all these reasons, we need appropriate modes of deliberation. And the second theme of universal uh, regulation for regenerative medicine, um, we see that the standards that are being developed, bioethical standards and research standards, have led to dilemmas for countries, whether they need to adopt very expensive and unmanageable regulation from abroad, or give in to the desire of uh, uh, to develop clinical products. Uh, products invested in by local governments and scientists. So in various countries, and this is the example of China, a stalemate has come about between this desire also of the government to introduce uh, regulation, especially for the elite laboratories in the country, and the people that have been uh, supported by local governments uh, to find stem cell uh, solutions for patients in various areas of the country. It is very difficult to get uh, to solve this dilemma. What scientists need is regulation uh, to be both appropriate to the setting and not invalidate dated by the dominant international science community for, for being unethical. What I propose is a slowdown of the globalization of life science regulatory development. Uh, this could actually uh, end the regulatory stalemates in many countries. Uh, we need an inclusion of what are now seen as rogue scientists from developing countries in defining regulatory boundaries. It needs to be rooted uh, we need a rooting of international and national collaborations in local communities after proactive deliberation. And the creation of appropriate research regulation requires insights into the current practices of collaborative networks and a variety of standards used in the life science communica communities. And 
we need communication between science, patients, regulators and industry about local needs. And here I come to the role that biomedical anthropology can play in all this. It could identify concerns among experts, patients and other populations uh, about safety, efficacy, treatment choice and the financial implications of adopting new technologies. So in some areas we find that uh, people in wheelchairs with spinal cord injury might prioritise road safety to stem cell treatment in the long run. A second role that biomedical anthropology could play would be to map the exchanges between collaborating institutions to understand the drivers and logic of life science networks. A third role for biomedical anthropology would be to identify bottlenecks in communication between policy making bodies and institutions. Sometimes the implementation of guidelines um, gets stuck somewhere in between the top levels of companies or uh, civil uh, service organisations and the ground level. And there may be very practical reasons that are particular to that environment that need to be dealt with and might actually require a reformulation of the regulation. A fourth role for biomedical anthropology could be to compare the living conditions and different needs in the different societies and groups concerned. Um, our research group uh, in a project called Bionetwork in Asia has been comparing four different diseases, spinal cord injury, uh, muscular dystrophy, uh, heart diseases and diabetes. Um, we've been comparing the needs of the patients with those diseases in various different countries, including China and India. And it turned out that there is an enormous variety in the, in the priorities that people in different uh, locations uh, have of uh, their lives. So this ranges from low to high-tech solutions. Uh, low-tech solutions would be uh, em employment, be treated respectful. Um, some people would have said, well, love and care for people with disabilities. And others would say, well, we want uh, a good stem cell treatment as soon as possible. And it, there is a great variety. And so we need to match the needs with the solutions that we are investing uh, a lot of uh, funding into. A fifth role for biomedical anthropology would be to identify clashes between healthcare choices of social groups and communities and to create spaces for discussion. So we've been uh, organising workshops in combination with high profile uh, discussions between regulators, uh, uh, policy makers, scientists and patients um, and also um, using this experience to co-author briefings. A sixth role for biomedical anthropology would be the study of how life science knowledge and beliefs are validated. So how knowledge becomes uh, authoritative, how it is created in and through society and how it affects the lives, livelihoods and ex existential values of people. And all of this, of course, makes for a very full anthropological toolbox, not only uh, of the traditional methods of participant observations, interviewing, etc., but also for the maintenance of language ability. People uh, doing research uh, can do it so much better when speaking the local language. And we also need to be aware what's going on in the life sciences, being up to date on the state of the art. Anthropology places a lot of emphasis on local experiences and because it tries to link these experiences with global issues, anthropology is extremely slow, especially compared to, for instance, disciplines like um, international relations or politics. But we do not need a speedy introduction alien of alien guidelines. Uh, they are not good for solving local pro uh, pro problems. 
And we, we emphasize the importance of local community networks with their own sets of life values and standards. The life sciences in Europe have very much increased our ability to create, extend, alter, shorten, lengthen lives. Traditional notions of birth, life, death, no longer or may no longer correspond with the experienced realities in the new uh, world that we are creating through the life sciences. Nevertheless, debates on these issues are mainly confined to academic communities. When I was doing research six years ago among Japanese scientists on that were doing embryonic stem cell research, uh, they entertained two different views on the embryo. One that was fitted to their work on the bench, in the laboratory, and another much more emotional one uh, that linked up with their personal life at home. But we usually hear from the scientist only the former. Is that we need a far more broad um, discussion, also including non-scientists, also including non-academia. When we hear concepts like NIPT, neurobiology, metabolomics, um, comparative genomic hybridization, uh, regenerative medicine, whole genome sequencing, I bet that most people in society have not even heard of them. Nevertheless, these technologies will shape the, la the lives of us over the coming uh, few years. So what I would argue for is slow and inclusive deliberation, including local communities. And they need to have a chance to decide the difference between biotech hypes and the possibilities offered by new biomedical technologies. They need to have the chance to understand how new biotech can affect local beliefs of the good life and prevalent lifestyles in communities. And this would include those that are concerned with, um, involved in and affected by the introduction of new biotechnology. I would like to thank my uh, research team. Um, I also would like to thank uh, my mentors in the Netherlands, in the UK, in China, in Japan. I also would like to thank my colleagues here at home in Amsterdam University, Leiden University, and my family and friends. And last and certainly not least, um, Alex, who has never ceased to support me. Thank you very much. <laughs>